So what do you say we spend a little time in the greenhouse today? All right, all right, all right. I've got a good bit to do in here today. I got some stuff I got to take home with me. My garden's about 20 minutes away from here. So stuff I got to take home so I can plant this weekend. And I've got two more trays to finish out my spring seed starting schedule. Just two more trays to plant. So a lot to do today. Let's go inside, see how everything's looking, and let's get some stuff planted. So before we go inside, I'll tell you about this greenhouse for a minute. We've had a lot of people asking about it. We've done a video or two on it in the past, but give you a little more recent analysis of what we got here. So this is a 16 by 10 come from Atlas Greenhouses, which is right down the road from us. You can find them online at atlasgreenhouse.com. They got tons of different options, but this one here works pretty good for us, 10 by 16. It is sitting on a footer right there. You can see the cinder blocks down there. And so no hard walls on this. It's just a uh, metal tubing frame and then the plastic sits in there with that wiggle wire that you see there. But the main thing about this greenhouse that's important is to have these roll up sides here. So we can just come right here and we can let those down. If it's getting cool or we can roll them all the way up like they are today and if you got a greenhouse in the south you got to have that ventilation it just gets way too hot in there even today which is early march way too hot in there so having one with roll up sides is very important for us now if you live up north you probably don't need the roll up sides but uh very very handy to have those and once it gets hot like it is now those sides stay rolled up most all the time so a very simple greenhouse I think we've had to replace that plastic on there once in about 10 or 12 years and uh that's a good half a day job but not too bad considering you don't have to do it that often and then we do have an actual door there most of this is just that plastic film around it fitted in there tight with that wiggle wire and now back to the plant so all this stuff sitting outside here or the majority of it i'm taking home today because I'm going to be planting not all these, but at least a few plants from all these different varieties. Tomatoes, peppers here that are ready to go in the ground. Our temps have warmed up here, and I feel comfortable going ahead and putting those puppies in the ground. Looks like Dad started a tray of zinnias here that have germinated, started to come up. So I guess no heat map for those. He's just been letting those roll outside, which... Uh, with the warm temps we have and they're just fine and then it looks like a little bit of container gardening going on here I don't know what variety of tomato that is there. I think it may be a yellow canary He's got in there in a pot. He always plants something in that big pot there does a little container gardening outside the greenhouse Let's go inside and see what's going on here So those peppers that Jason at Cog Hill sent me still haven't came up I think I'm ready to just give up on them it's been almost four weeks some peppers can take four weeks but four weeks on a heat mat in this warm greenhouse and nothing tells me them seeds might have lost their juice i don't know what else is going on right here looks like mom or dad started a little tray of something these are all the peppers we did on the last video some of these giant pepper varieties the colossus jalapeno that big cayenne all that good stuff Looks like um, somebody's got a smorgasbord of sunflowers here. I would have to guess that this is Miss Hoss's tray here. And those guys are starting to come up there. So a whole tray of all different kind of sunflowers it looks like. Right here are two trays we're gonna be planting a little later. We'll come back to that. Our seedless watermelons we planted on the last video are starting to come up a little slow. Well, we're starting to get some germination there so just kind of waiting patiently for those guys to do their thing dad's baby doll watermelons have almost all completely germinated right there so that's a heap of watermelon plants he should have plenty of baby doll watermelons if he plants all those over here on the other side our determinate tomatoes are close they are close i say another week or two and those babies will be ready to pull out of that tray and plant in the ground. So they a lot further along than they was last time I showed them to you. They are close. Here's a tray of Bella Roses Dad planted with looks like pretty much 100% germination there. Yes, those are uh, for the neighbors. 
Our flower trays are very, very close. Most of the varieties at least, very, very close to going in the ground. Um, some of these marigolds here, I'll say another week or two on those guys. Zinnias back here, won't be long for those guys to pull right out of the tray. Our ageratum is gonna be a little bit while, or a little while. These things are a little more heat loving and I really won't take off till it gets good and hot. So we'll just probably have to pick around these trays right here and not plant all these varieties at one time. Our herbs right here, I was gonna thin these. And then after that last video, a lot of people said they wouldn't fool with it. They just plant that whole plug right there. Don't worry about thinning them. So I think that's what I'm gonna do. But uh, I think I'm gonna take these home with me today as well. All this stuff is, is close, real close to being going in the ground. So I'll take it home, let it sit outside, harden off a little bit, and we'll get these in the ground hopefully within the next week. All right, so that's what's growing and germinating now. And like I said, I got two more trays to start. And those two things are a tray of okra and a tray of winter squash slash pumpkins. Now both of these things, okra and winter squash slash pumpkins, can easily be direct seeded in the garden. A lot of the stuff we grow in here, you can very well direct seed it. The thing is, if you're going to direct seed it, you got to wait till the soil temp warms up enough outside to get good germination. Okra will not germinate in cool soils. So if we're going to direct seed okra, we probably got to wait till early April to put it in the ground. Whereas if we start it in here, we can get it going and we can be putting plants in the ground when everybody else is putting seeds in the ground and we can have okra a lot sooner. With the winter squash and pumpkins, I usually don't like to plant those until early April anyways. It's just kind of one of the later things on my planting to-do list in the spring. And so I'm not in a big hurry to plant them. I like to get everything else out of the way first. And as a result, I just like starting them in the greenhouse here and uh, transplanting the plugs. I haven't always transplanted winter squash and pumpkins, but I started doing the last couple years and I, I kind of really like it. They just seem to take off a little bit better and got a little more vigor. And uh, we usually get a pretty good success rate with our transplants. We usually don't have many of them that die. Now, every time we do a video talking about transplanting okra, we always have some folks that tell us we're crazy. That's way too much work for okra. Just throw it in the ground and let it grow. And once them soil temps warm up, yeah, it does germinate just fine in the ground and grow well. But if having okra early is important to you, then I would highly recommend transplanting. If it doesn't really matter that much, just direct seed it in the ground. Whatever works for you. Yes, okra is a heat-loving plant and it's going to grow and produce all throughout the summer. But if you want to get a jump start on everybody, you're having a little friendly competition with your neighbor, then you can transplant it and you start making okra quicker than the people that are direct seeding it. So now let's talk about varieties. So every year when I grow okra in my garden, I do an okra trial. I plant one variety that we grow every single year and then I usually like to compare it to anywhere from three to five varieties I have never grown before. And dad usually does some trials in his garden as well. Last year he compared jambalaya to a variety called heavy hitter, which everybody said was supposed to be the bomb and it, it wasn't the bomb. So he did a trial last year. Last year I did a trial with jambalaya, uh, silver queen, cow horn, red burgundy which i do like a lot and i can't remember the other variety but we compared a lot of those on some videos last year so this year what i'm planting is jambalaya of course this is the one that's yet to be beat as far as production goes it starts producing earlier than other okra varieties and just makes a lot of okra um, the one thing if there's ever any complaints about this variety is that it does get tough at longer lengths it's best picked about three to four inches long some people don't like to pick their okra every day or every other day and they want these long pods if that's the case this variety is not for you but if you're going for production and you like okra about that size right there this one here will produce more than any variety you've ever seen so we really like the jambalaya the plants stay more compact they don't get real tall and you have to reach up there bend over for them 
uh, reach up there and bend over the plant to pick them. So this is our favorite. We grow this one every year. And the ones I'm going to compare it to this year, got this one here called Emerald Green Velvet. Uh, some people call this Louisiana Velvet Okri. So we're going to try that one. This is a new one we added called Jing Orange. Looks kind of like the red burgundy, so we're going to give that one a try. And then this Perkins Long Pod Okri. We're going to give that one a try. So we got our jambalaya that likes to be picked at the shorter lengths. And then some of these others here we can let get a little longer and uh, try them out that way. So we'll be able to see, you know, how long they get before they get tough, which ones produce more. You know, we'll be able to do some trials and, and really compare these four varieties here. And then as far as the winter squash and pumpkin varieties go, I got quite the selection here. In the past years, I've just planted one big plot and picked one variety. We did the South Anna butternut squash last year, and that one was absolutely awesome. But since we're not growing for market anymore, we're just growing for ourselves, I'm adding a lot more variety and playing around growing a lot of different stuff not just one big plot of the same thing now when it comes to winter squash or pumpkins you can plant different species kind of in the same area there even though they require pollinators as long as they are indeed different species so you've got kind of four main species of winter squash or squash in general you got cucurbita pepo or sea pepo you got cucurbita maxima cucurbita moshata and cucurbita mixta and so there's four different ones there and as long as you don't plant multiple varieties of the same species you don't have to worry about any cross pollination there so that's what we're going to do here so let me go through the ones i have here so we'll start off with our cucurbita pepos and we're growing some giant pumpkins this year i'll probably make an official announcement on this on a row by row show in the next week or so but ourselves and some other youtubers are kind of putting on this giant pumpkin growing competition along with all of our great customers so i'll be letting you in on the rules for that pretty soon no big rush to get started. We'll give everybody plenty of time to grow a big giant pumpkin. But I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to end up planting one of these varieties. I'm going to just see which one looks the best after growing a transplant. So I'm going to try Atlantic Giant and Big Max. We've got a couple other giant pumpkin varieties on the site you could try as well. But I'm going to go with these two here, Atlantic Giant and Big Max. Whichever one I like to transplant the best is the one I'm going to go with. So that's my C. Pepo varieties. Those pumpkins, jack-o'-lanterns, anything like that are all C. Pepo. For the other varieties, for the C. Maxima, growing this one here, this is a new one called Speckle Hound Squash. And I don't even know if this will be on the website by the time this video airs, but if not, it will be on there shortly. This is a new one we just added, real pretty, supposed to be really good tasting squash there. And then for our C. Machada variety, I love growing butternuts. This is a new one we just added called Autumn Gold. So it's got a little different coloration than a traditional butternut. So we're going to give that one a try. And then the last species is the Cucurbita Mixta. And I think we only have one variety in this species, and that's the Green Stripe Cushaw Squash. So we're going to give those a try. So my plan is to plant a row of each. You need to spread these rows out pretty far with pumpkins and winter squash. So I'm probably going to give them a five foot row space and just do four rows in that 30 by 35 plot, four or five rows. So each variety or each species will get a row there and we'll just have a smorgasbord of pumpkins and winter squash out there to harvest when they get ready. Now you might be asking yourself, why are they growing pumpkins in the spring? Nobody wants pumpkins in the middle of summer. Everybody wants pumpkins in the fall. Why not just grow them in the fall? Well, down here in South Georgia, we have a hard time growing pumpkins in the fall just due to heat, humidity, insect, and disease pressure. So if you want to grow pumpkins for Halloween or for fall decorating or whatever around here, you really got to plant them early July. Around July 4th is kind of the target date. And it's just tough. Now, there are some powdery, mildew-resistant varieties out there that you can grow that help you out a little bit but it's tough to get some really good production you got to be on top of your spraying game it's just tough to grow them that time of year so we got to grow them in the spring and most of these varieties especially the edible ones store 
for like six to eight months sometimes so they'll store on even on into the winter i've got some butternut squash the south anna butternut squash still on my uh, rack underneath my barn that are still good been there for you know eight or ten months or so so all these things store really well um, on you know once they kind of cure it underneath our barn there so we grow them in the spring and we can grow them a lot easier harvest them in the summer and they'll still store into winter for us most of the pumpkin patches around here don't actually grow their own pumpkins they're bringing them in from tennessee or somewhere up north there's a lot of them growing in tennessee but it's just so hard to grow them down here for the fall that most people just bring them in they make it look like they grew them but they didn't um, so we may try some pumpkins in the fall some of the powdery mildew resistant varieties just just for fun but we know right now is our main production window for pumpkins and winter squash and that's why we're doing this pumpkin contest in the spring as opposed to the fall so for these pumpkins and winter squash we got to make some pretty decent size dibbles here in these 162 trays because these seeds are pretty big especially for these giant pumpkins here so a lot deeper planting than if we're planting something like tomatoes or peppers we want to make sure that soil is nice and wet we wet it down really good before we do this that way we can make an indention in there and it will actually stick as far as these giant pumpkins go i told you i'm trying this big max an atlantic giant and there's some strategies you can use there to make the pumpkins get bigger and we'll probably talk about that and experiment a little bit with that as we're growing these things you can go in and kind of prune the vines or prune the fruit so that you only got you know one fruit per plant or two fruits per plant and that makes the energy uh, of the plant be devoted a lot more to just those few pumpkins and those few will get bigger as opposed to leaving a bunch of them on there and just being kind of medium sized so we'll probably have to do a little bit of that with these guys here i'm no giant pumpkin growing expert but i do understand some of the uh process these people use to grow these things i'm sure um it always happens anytime we do one of these contests one of our customers always grows much bigger sunflower well, the sunflowers last year they grow a much bigger one than us youtubers do but it's always fun to have a little friendly competition here the other two giant pumpkin varieties we have to choose from are prize winner and mammoth gold and i think prize winner might be out of stock right now but i'm getting some more of that soon so we'll get that one restocked and then we got the mammoth gold in stock currently and i really have no idea which variety produces <clears throat> the biggest pumpkin so uh, that's going to be interesting to see not only who can grow the biggest pumpkin but which of these four varieties they used and that's going to be part of the rules of the contest just to keep everything fair you got to grow one of these four varieties we carry um, you can't be growing some crazy hybrid special you know stock seed this some giant pumpkin somewhere grower somewhere grows we'll try to keep it fair so we're going to keep it amongst these four varieties here and these c machata winter squash species like your butternuts or your seminole pumpkins or your cherokee tan pumpkins these are the ones that are pretty much resistant to squash vine borers so if you have a lot of issues with squash vine borers then these don't have the hollow stems there and uh the, the vine borers don't really bother them whereas they will bother some of these other species so keep that in mind um, cherokee tan's a good one seminole's a good one any of the butternuts south anna um, any of the sea machata species if you have heavy vine borer pressure those are the ones you need to go with so we got our winter squash in now it's time to plant this oak tree right here in our trays in our 162 trays and uh, i'll probably just plant um, a row or so of each of these varieties so i won't need 50 transplants but i'm gonna go ahead and pack a whole plant a whole seed pack for each of these varieties i'll have some backups there one thing about transplanting okri where you got to be a little careful just like when you direct seed in okri if you try to put these transplants in the ground when it ain't good and hot yet they going some of them's gonna die on you um okri does not like cool weather so 
just like if you try to direct seed it when it ain't hot enough yet you're not going to get very good germination rates if you put plugs in the ground when it's not quite hot enough yet not a lot of them are going to survive so we'll start them now we're early to middle march right now they'll be ready in about four weeks that time will be into the first or second week of april It'll be plenty warm enough to get them in the ground then one thing that's unique about okri is it's one of those crops that has a lot of heirloom varieties with it and it's also one of them crops where you've got a lot of different naming names for it and a lot of people might call the same variety a different name and seed companies do this too it drives me crazy because it just makes things confusing for people for instance jambalaya okra there's a seed company out there that calls it gumbo okra. It's the same exact thing. We try to call it what the breeder calls it just to keep everything simple. But a lot of places out there will rename things to make it seem like it's something different. Um, the famous Parks Whopper tomato is a perfect example. That's not a unique variety. It's just a hybrid tomato that they renamed to make it look like it was something different than it was. So be on the watch out for that you see a lot of that with okri all these different names out there and a lot of them end up being the same thing um, that heavy hitter okra that dad grew last year <coughs> we talked to a kind of an okra specialist guy and he said it's just basically a bush version of clips and spineless and um, that may be why it didn't really impress us that much but it didn't uh, just blow us out of the water like everybody thought it was we were planning on growing it and then carrying that variety if we liked it but uh, we didn't really care much for it so we didn't add it to the seed lineup this year we did add that jing orange which i'm really excited about trying i like the colorful okras a lot if you've been watching the channel for a while you know i have a certain way i like to grow my okra i don't like big bushy plants i don't like having to fight through all those leaves and end up just itchy and a hot mess after trying to pick it i like to prune those side branches as it grows so all my okra is right there on the top of the plant i don't have to look for it and i go through there and pick it and i'll show you how we do that once we start growing this stuff or once we put this in the ground but i don't care for a big bushy okra plant i get it if you're just growing one or two plants and you want all that production for not a lot of space <clears throat> go for it but i don't like having to fight through all those leaves to cut my okra so i just i'd rather just plant me a 30 foot row of it have it all sitting right there on the top and i can zip up and down that row and uh harvest my okra that way and then the last thing to do here is to cover our seeds and uh, if you watch many of our seed starting videos you know we like to use perlite you can use more seed starting mix you can use vermiculite but uh, we like to use perlite. We just did a lot of testing with different stuff in here and uh, just like how it provides some good aeration on that surface there. Don't get a lot of algal build up. Someone on the last video was saying that uh, it actually helps with fertilizer retention as well because of the uh, large surface area on that perlite. Although it's not that big, those little pebbles are pretty small has a lot of surface area for retaining nutrients there to feed your plants so that's something interesting i didn't know there are lots of good reasons why we like to use it but that's just another added benefit there of topping with perlite as opposed to more seed starting mix i'd say the only real downside of the perlite is uh it's a little dusty it's a little messy i don't know that you'd want to be doing this right here you're doing growing stuff inside you probably won't do this outside and then bring them inside another thing is is when we pick these trays up like here and just kind of let them fall to our side some of that falls off of there but uh not a huge deal but it is a little more messier than some of the other processes but we really like it and that's why we continue to do it all right all right all right so unless i have forgotten something i think that's the last two trays i need to grow out for spring my okri my winter squash and pumpkins i think that just about covers it which is good because it's starting to get hot in this greenhouse here and uh this is not a fun place once it gets real hot outside even with those doors open it can 
it can get pretty toasty in here as far as the oak tree goes we'll mention one other thing we have a lot of the old timers will tell us that you need to soak your oak tree seeds before planting them and they'll say you need to soak them in something that breaks down that tough outer shell makes them germinate quicker and if that works for you go for it i'm not trying to stop you from doing that but we've never found that to be necessary if you've got good heat you know you can put them on a heat map put them somewhere warm they usually germinate just fine and, and we get you know always in the 90s as far as percentage goes of germination if you want to soak them go for it but i found that's an unnecessary step if you can give the trays adequate heat or you wait long enough to your grounds warm and direct seed them there so you see what we do here we transplant our winter squash and okri but i love to hear what you do are these two crops you like to transplant as well or maybe something you're thinking about transplanting or do you think this is just a complete waste of time about as well just wait till the ground warms up put the seeds in the ground there's no right or wrong answer but i love to hear what you like to do your preferred methods for your garden i'll put some links below to all these okri and winter squash varieties we planted today so you can head on over to our website and check those out if you enjoyed this video make sure to give me a big thumbs up don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and ring that bell so you get notified every time we come out the new video and if you did enjoy this one make sure to check out these two videos right here i think you'll really enjoy those as well we'll see you next time